wonderful conference. And um, I'm Connie Callahan. I'm a judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And I'm feeling very lonely, except for a recovering judge down here, uh, Judge Mike McConnell. <laughs> so uh, are there any other judges in the building? I guess, that's what I thought. So uh, by after a day and a half of listening to uh, professors and scholars and all sorts of others, I'm a little bit crazy just being a judge here in terms of the, uh, someone pointed out that the bag that I carry uh, that someone gave me says, skirt the rules. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, we're going to be maybe a little bit of, uh, we're going to build on everything that's been going on the last day and a half, but I think what we're going to do that's a little bit different is we're going to spend a little more time in terms of how the parties and the political process bleeds over to doctrine, the doctrine of separation of powers, something that as a judge I'm quite interested in and I've been listening to everyone speak and I've been envisioning all of you uh, with your political theory and thinking how would you decide cases in terms of how this all equates over. So I have, I'm not going to go into detail in terms of you have who all of my panel members are, but I've asked them, uh, what I do have on the panel is I have one person that is a heart on your sleeve ro romantic, another that's an originalist, another that's a left wing populist, another that's an analyst rather than an advocate, and another that's a conservative book editor. So you all can decide, you all can decide uh, I made them put a description on themselves. You can decide whether they fit it or, or and you may put it on someone else. But um, the, uh, also in terms of their background, all of the people that I have here are, they're professors. Of course, uh, I only do adjunct work, so I fall out of, and I'm only the moderator. So I might remind you when even though I ask provocative questions and some of them are going to be about judging and separation of powers, judges get to ask the questions. You don't get to ask me the questions. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, I might not be able to help myself to, uh, to jump in on some of them. So I have, I think, amidst, I have, I think all, all we have one non-lawyer, though, and uh, so I think that's all good to keep us honest. Um, we have three uh, Supreme Court SCOTUS clerks. We, I think all of my professors have been clerks to uh, some sort of judge, and so they have some experience with dealing with separation of powers issues. But So I, I'm really curious. We're going to do the talking head part, as uh, many of the panels have done, and I've given each of my panelists uh, 12 minutes to start because we have the biggest panel. I'm calling them the biggest and the brightest, but that's not to take away from anyone else. And so they'll get their warning when they have two minutes left, and I'm told that because I'm a judge and I'm bossy that I'm probably the only ones that can keep them to their 12 <laughs> minutes. Um, after that, we're gonna, I'll be asking questions and moderating uh, pan uh, questions um, amidst the panel, and then we'll leave time at the end for discussion. So without further ado, our, the name of our panel is based on an article that's written by Rick uh, Pildes, and so I'm going to have Rick uh, kick it off. So thank you very much, Judge, and I apologize to all of you since you just had to listen to me on the last panel. I feel very awkward. Uh, about speaking on a, a follow-up panel, especially as the first uh, first speaker, um, so it's uh, it's kind of hard for me to believe, looking back at this article that uh, the judge referred to, uh, separation of parties, not powers, was written in 2006, uh, and back then it was part of an effort to begin to. Uh, try to understand and think about how the, the transformation of the American political party system that has really been a theme today and I gather yesterday also, um, how that should affect the way we thought about constitutional law or public law. So what does the rise of these intensely polarized political parties that began to emerge in the 1980s uh, and has sort of increased relentlessly ever since then at a fairly steady rate. Uh, and when I wrote this in 2006, I, I said I thought the polarization would just continue to get worse. Uh, and I do think it has in the ensuing decade. 
Um, how should it uh, be understood in terms of the way in which we think about public law, administrative law, and constitutional law uh, in particular? Um, and the effort um, on my part was to try to bring more political realism to understanding the actual behavior of governmental institutions uh, to the way in which constitutional law or public law is thought about and to push back uh, against more what I would call formalistic uh, understandings and a nod to my, my friend Will here uh, who's going to attack this when he gets his chance. Um, so I don't want to repeat the, the article, of course, here, but just for those of you who haven't been exposed to it, the core insight is that in a world of hyper-polarized political parties, the president of the party in power largely determines the meaning and the political appeal of the party label, and that the electoral fate of members of the party in the House and the Senate are very powerfully tied to the, the favorability, uh, popularity of the party label, which is largely determined, as I said, by the president and the favorability ratings of the president, and that this has profound implications for thinking about a whole variety of questions um, in the area of separation of uh, powers. Um, so uh, just to um, uh, give you a couple of immediate implications from this way of beginning to think and talk about the separation of powers in a world of hyper-polarized political parties. Uh, one implication is it's a mistake to generalize from how the separation of powers system performed in certain other points, in the, at certain other points in the past uh, to our era of hyper-polarized political parties. Or more concretely, one example, uh, David Mayhew wrote a very famous book called Divided We Govern, in which he argued that during divided government, the legislative process was actually as productive as it was during periods of unified government. Um, taking issue with the idea that you know, divided government and the separation of power system in the United States made for less effective government. Well, Mayhew's book was looking at Congress's from the era before the era of hyperpolarized political parties. And once we entered into the kind of world we've been living with since the 1980s, but really more and more powerfully so over time, um, it's not true anymore that divided government uh, is capable of producing effective legislation on major policy issues of the day, uh, as identified by various metrics like uh, what pu uh, the public ranks as the 10 most pressing issues of the day uh, in the way divided government did uh, during the era in, May in which Mayhew wrote. Uh, and why is that? That's because the configuration of the political parties in the pre-polarized era was such that even with divided government, there were coalitions across the formal party lines that formed regularly on major policy issues. That's why you hear frequently that major policy reforms uh, up until more recently uh, were bipartisan, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, uh, uh, and various other major pieces of social legislation uh, during the, the non-polarized era. Uh, it was not uncommon to have bipartisan support for that kind of legislation. Um, it turns out Mayhew wasn't telling us something general about how divided government in the United States works. He was telling us something about how divided government works in an era of very loose, non-polarized political parties. Uh, so when we think about the separation of powers or how the system functions, uh, we actually have to understand it as, I think was said on the earlier panel uh, by Bruce Kane, there are, there are sort of two systems of American governance. There's the system of unified, or how the system works under unified government, and the system and how it works under divided government. Uh, and in a world of hyper-polarized -political, hyper -polarized political parties, uh, those systems work in very, very different ways. Uh, a second kind of implication is uh, the standard kind of Madisonian idea that underwrites so much of what we repeat to ourselves about separation of powers and teach in the law schools, 
that you know the system is designed so that institutional ambition will counteract institutional ambition. The House will be motivated to protect the interests of the House, the Senate the interests of the Senate, the presidency the interests of the presidency. Um, that that story doesn't really hold as a way of understanding the behavior of these institutions in a world in which you have political parties where the fate electorally of members of the House and the Senate is so tied to the fate of the president uh, and where the parties are so polarized. Uh, and instead what you see is in unified government, uh, much, you're going to get much less in the way of checks and balances on presidential power than is envisioned in this Madisonian idea of ambition naturally counteracting ambition. Um, and in divided government, you're going to get a system that with hyperpolarized parties, as we know, is very hard to make function or to deliver legislation on the major issues of the day uh, because of the, the hyperpolarization. OK, so if this sort of central behavioral, if you will, institutional insight uh, is correct, um, there are at least two principal directions for thinking about uh, what we might imagine as ways of responding to this reality of how the system works with hyperpolarized political parties. Um, first is if we still believe in the idea of checks and balances, if that's still considered an important aspect to try to build into the institutional structures of the political process, um, and we recognize we're not likely to get that, at least in unified government, in a really robust and meaningful way. It may occur occasionally, but we can't count on the system in that way as originally envisioned. Uh, we can start imagining ways of empowering within Congress the opposition party um, in certain sorts of respects, which in fact a number of democratic systems uh, do. Uh, systems in particular that were created uh, after the reality of political parties as a fixture of democratic governance was understood uh, and the effort to create mechanisms that made the loyal opposition able to have greater weight in the political process as a check on the majority party uh, was more fully understood. So for example, one can imagine uh, various mechanisms like the uh, party out of power uh, controls and some oversight sets of committees like audit committees or budget audit committees. Uh, the oppositional party uh, could, for example, on committees have subpoena power or the power to call witnesses under certain circumstances or with certain sorts of constraints. I mean, we can imagine uh, at least in theory, and as I say, many democratic systems have built in these kinds of structures, ways of creating separation of parties within Congress uh, or effective oppositional levers that the party out of power might still be able to have uh, so that checks and balances can remain effective even, or more effective at least, uh, in unified government uh, in a way you might think is actually more consistent with the original vision of the kind of bifurcated or trifurcated system of political power that is part of the institutional architecture uh, of the Constitution. Um, here's a more extreme example. Uh, you could imagine making the Attorney General through constitutional amendment, because I think it would require that, uh, an independent position, like a fixed term in office, which a number of democratic countries do do as a way of trying to ensure that the administration and enforcement of the law will be at a greater remove from direct political interference or pressuring uh, than exists in the American system in which the president has the power uh, to appoint and fire at will uh, the attorney um, general. Um, so you can start thinking along these lines. These are sort of institutional redesigns uh, that would recreate a system of checks and balances. Within Congress, we can also talk about uh, further empowering various oversight institutions outside of Congress, perhaps, as another way of responding to this reality. Now, none of those things are likely to happen as a realistic matter. Um, 
But the second direction we can think, which is more realistic, whether you like it or not, uh, is to think about constitutional and public law doctrine, uh, recognizing this reality uh, more directly. Uh, and so what this might mean is recognizing, for example, that in periods of unified government, Congress is unlikely to check the president as aggressively as perhaps originally envisioned. Uh, maybe courts lean against reading statutes as delegating powers to the president uh, with the recognition that if Congress actually thinks the president should have that power, the president's going to get a very receptive audience in a Congress controlled by the same party. Um, and maybe uh, during periods of divided government, uh, where it's very clear Congress is not going to respond one way or the other uh, to uh, the court's decisions about, let's say, interpreting statutes. Uh, the court takes a more aggressive role in reasoning about the underlying policies and purposes of the statute and is not nearly as textualist. Um, so this is um, my time to stop, right? 12 minutes? Yes? <laughs> 30 seconds? Well, I think, so this last point is a more general one, which is when we think about constitutional law and public law, courts face the underlying question of how formally they should look at the other institutions that they're evaluating, whether it's Congress, the presidency, courts, state courts, agencies, and the like. There's a very natural tendency to say, well, of course, courts have to be formalistic about that. Congress is always Congress. It doesn't matter if we have hyperpolarized political parties and divided government. The presidency is always the presidency, whether it's in an era in which we have very weak presidential power or an era after television and modern political parties and the domineering power of modern presidents. Um, or you can take the view or the path of what I call institutional realism and open up that black box of what these institutions are and how they actually perform in different eras uh, and take the view that judicial doctrine should actually, even though it's a scary prospect to be sure, uh, acknowledge these underlying behavioral realities of how these institutions function. Now my, my actual view is courts in fact are much more institutionally realist than they acknowledge being, and I could give you the evidence, some of that, but I won't say anything about that for now. Thank you, Rick. Will. Uh, thank you. Are you revved up? What? Are you revved up? Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> Uh, so Rick's article is a, a really profound one, and it's therefore dangerous to try to boil it down into you know a, a few sentences. But I think two of its you know key points are that parties essentially are something more powerful than the separation of powers that they have you know transgressed the limits the separation of powers was supposed to impose and instead impose their own limits. That's why during periods of unified government we don't get enough separation of powers. During periods of divided government we get too much separation of powers. Uh, and that's sort of a deep problem for anybody who cares about separation of powers and thought it got things just about right. And then that, that's sort of, in a sense, the descriptive analytical claim. And then there's a normative claim that we ought to do something about that. Uh, I think the descriptive analytical claim is profoundly true, maybe even truer than Rick's presentation uh, led us to believe. It's the normative claim I worry about. So on the descriptive claim, I think it's I think it's completely right that uh, we see these dynamics that we see. You know, Congress's role in checking presidential abuses and deciding when to authorize the use of force and uh, reviewing nominations, we could go through. We see that uh, systematically underperforming when uh, they're in the same party, systematically overperforming, and therefore badly performing when they're in opposite parties. I think that's exactly uh, what happens. And I think it makes it hard to sometimes to take seriously sort of the original separation of powers framework when we teach a bunch of modern controversies where it seems like it doesn't totally make sense. But I think, in a way, that's inevitable. So at the risk of, I feel like the last panel, we're supposed to be bringing things together. One of the themes throughout a lot of the, the panels is uh, pessimism and the inevitable force of parties. Uh, and I think there's a sense in which political parties were invented. Uh, certainly the, the Martin Van Buren version of the political party that organized the party at various levels of government with patronage and resources flowing up and down uh, from local to state to national 
the point was, in a sense, to break the Constitution and to break the separation of powers. I mean, the goal of the Constitution is to diffuse power, to limit power, by breaking it into pieces so that you have to gather up all the pieces before you can exercise all of the mighty powers of the federal government. And of course, because that power is valuable and could be used to give people things they really want, uh, they then set about uh, trying to find the pieces and reassemble them. Uh, and that means organizing a party that will control each of whatever branches you require it to control before it's allowed to exercise parties. Uh, I think that's, a, in a sense, it's a game of constitutional hide and seek. And there's a limit to how good any institutional design can be at solving it. Imagine we lived in the world of Harry Potter and broke the Constitution to seven horcruxes, each to be stashed in a different secret location. Uh, and only when you reassembled them all could you exercise the combined powers of the national government, people would set about you know, slaying dragons, uh, going through dungeons, whatever it took to, to find the pieces of power again and reassemble them. Uh, they'd be called something else, but they would be the equivalent in that constitutional system of political parties. Uh, so I think political parties are just, are just, in a sense, machines designed to break the constitutional limits of power. That's, that's the whole point. Uh, and therefore, it's probably uh, fruitless in the long run to try to imagine we could create a new way of domesticating them into the, con the Constitution, a new set of institutions that would stop that. Uh, if we <clears throat> had an attorney general who was elected outside of the current party or picked outside of the current party system, then part of your presidential program would be to control the law enforcement apparatus through whatever means that took. If it wasn't elections, it would be through some other, you know, giving the CIA immunity from uh, liability for whatever uh, misdeeds it had committed or something else. Uh, if you had an oversight committee, then that would become part of the, the party machine as well. If you have, as we know, if you have independent redistricting commissions, parties figure out, you know, what kind of independence they have to get on the resistance commission to get the, the results they want. So I think that's just, that's just an inevitable part of the, the institutional structure. Uh, in a sense, the best we can hope for there is to try to direct all that energy to the public good. Uh, and there, I wonder, maybe the Constitution doesn't do any worse than we could hope. In a sense, by requiring, you know, by saying that the rule for assembling all the powers of the national government requires you to win a bunch of elections across slightly different cuts of the electorate, across slightly different periods of time, and then to sort of you know, win them repeatedly over time and stay in power. We're requiring people to assemble a kind of relatively large consensus across a lot of people in favor of their political program. And maybe that's, maybe that's really the best we could hope for in terms of directing the, the party's energies better than sending them off onto you know, pointless quests. Uh, so it seems to me the descriptive claim is true, uh, but, but I wonder what to make of that. Then we get to the normative claim, uh, and especially the idea that judges ought to take account of what's really going on when adjudicating the separation of powers. Uh, and this plays into something else uh, Rick has written about repeatedly and, again, profoundly, which is this idea of sort of institutional formalism and realism. You know, courts deal with constitutional or legal institutions all the time. Uh, and then they have to decide when to treat those institutions as a black box, that they just don't ask you know, how things go in and come out. Think of the jury 99% of the time as an example, although occasionally courts do break open the box in extreme cases. Uh, and then when instead they should say, you know, we know what's really going on here. Think of the, the treatment of federalism during the, during the civil rights movement, where federal courts treated southern states uh, as if they were you know, not behaving like appropriate states, which they weren't. Um, unlike Rick, I do think uh, formalism is the normal mode for courts in our, in our system. Uh, I think y you saw this a little bit in uh, oral argument now several years ago in King versus Burwell, uh, the Obamacare litigation number two, where there was this, you know, basically a, a Scrivener's error in the Affordable Care Act that had come about through some sloppy amendments uh, that led to the possibility of, of destroying the way the healthcare exchanges would work. And at the Supreme Court, one question people rightly asked uh, the Solicitor General was, you know, if this is really uh, something that isn't supposed to be this way, it's obviously should be fixed. Why don't you just go back to Congress and have them uh, and have them fix it? And I think the, the, I don't think you know, normally the Solicitor General is very practiced. I don't think this answer was was planned. I it, think it, just, it was okay. Good. <laughs> uh, the answer that came out in the moment and then apparently planned was this Congress. Uh, which was, you know, the way of saying, yes, normally in statutory interpretation cases we have this fiction that if there's a mistake, Congress can fix it and therefore you shouldn't worry about whether or not there's sort of a mistake of that sort. But we all know that's not going to happen because the uh, Congress that had gotten elected hated uh, the Affordable Care Act and certainly was not going to be caught dead fixing it. Uh, and so, you know, there was no chance, there's no chance of that happening. Uh, that, I think that 
method of, of thinking about it did not seem to attract a lot of uh, attention on the court. Now maybe maybe that's secretly in the heart of hearts of the justices what motivated them, and they just instead felt the need to address everything they did uh, in, in formalism rather than realism. But I think there's a, an allergy among judges, at least in admitting, that they're opening up the black box and peeking under the hood. Uh, and I think that's a really good thing. Uh, I think that judges ought to be very worried about this invitation to engage in institutional formalism uh, for at least three reasons. Uh, one is that formalism is correct, uh, that the Constitution is written in forms, is written in these categories that creates institutions and gives them powers and doesn't make those powers depend on uh, whether or not the, you know, who, who is holding the office and whether or not we like the current constellation of people holding or not holding the office. Uh, that's just the, the, the way the forms of the Constitution were created, and it's a good idea for judges to generally take the law as they find it, rather than to set about tinkering, thinking they can improve it, thinking they know better. Uh, two, more practically, I think ju uh, judges themselves rely heavily on institutional formalism. So the judges really, really don't like it when they issue rulings and then uh, the president or somebody else says that he doesn't have to obey them because the people who held the office were people from the other party who are really part of the resistance, whose legal rulings can't be trusted, or that he knows what's really going on inside the black box of the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals or the District Court. Uh, and they're not applying law and they're doing something else and he's not going to follow it anymore. Uh, we have a, a very long tradition of, of obedience, at least to, to court orders, even by presidents and I think that's a good tradition and one that the courts uh, need if they're going to do anything. But I think they open up they open up black boxes at their peril because then they would invite other people to start opening up uh, their black box. And I think that's a very uh, dangerous road for them to go down. Um, and then I think there's an even bigger danger, which brings us back to the the question of political parties breaking the Constitution, uh, which is there's nothing that stops political parties from capturing the judiciary if that's what they have to do. Uh, and indeed, uh, maybe nothing that has stopped them. Uh, so if you know the rule is that the courts are going to be the ones to restrain a unified government by empl employing harsher rules uh, than or you know, vice versa for divided government, then that's just one more piece of the government you have to capture if you want to run your unified government the way you want to. So in a way, becoming realists about this process uh, I think just makes the courts themselves part of the process. There's no way and I do think Madison knew this, there's no way we can sort of hypothesize a perfect judiciary sitting outside all of the problems of faction and politics and human ambition that uh, make us need the Constitution in the first place. And so it's a mistake to, to imagine that the judiciary can supply solutions uh, to those kinds of problems. They'll just become enmeshed, enmeshed in the problem as it, themselves. Uh, <clears throat> so, so I guess that's three. Uh, that leads me to a very pessimistic place. Um, <laughs> I think so. If courts are going to to wade into politics, they're more likely to be, you know, either ignored for political reasons and or to, as I say, trigger the, you know, be captured by politics. Uh, so in a way, I think the best we can hope for from the courts. I mean, if this is all going on, if the you know constitutional system just ends up breaking down during periods of of extreme political control. I think the best we can hope for from the courts, in a sense, is the, the equivalent of the, the monasteries of the Dark Ages. Uh, maybe if they mind their own business, uh, if they don't uh, open up the black box too much, uh, maybe they can get everybody to leave them alone uh, so they can at least preserve some amount of knowledge and the rule of law and legal interpretation uh, in their own limited sphere uh, so that one day when better times come along, we still have that uh, to make use of in the future. Uh, <laughs> But if they, if they charge out of the monastery thinking that they have the power to, you know, to stop the Dark Ages, they'll just all get killed. <laughs> Charles? Thank you. Charles? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, even though I'm the non-lawyer uh, on the panel. So um, as a non-lawyer, I can only say obvious and basic things as a political scientist. Um, and so I thought I would uh, say, uh, um, say a few things about separation of powers and parties and the problem of polarization, which seems to be the focus of, our, of all of the panels uh, in this uh, conference. 
Well, if you, um, if you l look at the Federalist Papers, if you look at Madison and Hamilton's account of separation of powers, it had three goals. Um, the first and the most obvious one is the one that progressive political scientists have seized upon as the essence of separation of powers, but it isn't. The first goal of separation was to prevent tyranny, where tyranny was designed as, an, as the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same set of hands. In Madison's famous definition, whether one, few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective. That's one obvious and very important function. But it had two others. The second was to encourage good government by allowing each branch to perform its function well and to specialize in its task, to allow a president to be more presidential, to, the, to allow the legislature to be more deliberative, to allow the judiciary to be more judicious. This was not about stopping bad actions. It was, in fact, about encouraging and aiding good actions, actions that would eventuate in good government. And the third uh, function of separation of powers uh, is the least remarked upon, I think. And that was it played an important part in encouraging the supremacy of constitutional law over statute law. It did so by encouraging the government to control itself through these internal mechanisms of checks and balances, ambition, counteracting ambition. If the government could control itself and police its own branches, the people would not have to intervene in government itself. The people would not have to execute laws or judge uh, in particular cases uh, or even to legislate for themselves directly. In this way, the people's authority is separate from the government. The government is always the representatives, the employees of the people. The people's authority is never implicated in any direct action of government, except, of course, through um, elections. And so, so the government could be, as Madison described it, wholly popular, uh, that is, having no aristocratic or monarchical components, but exclusively representative. Or, as he described it, Madison in Federalist 49, the reason of the public would be able to control the government and the government would be able to control the passions of the public. The reason of the public means the Constitution. The authority of the people is entirely centered on the Constitution, not on the government or the operations of the government. The, the people, the, the, the people, as it were, set up the Constitution and through the Constitution their embodied reason in the Constitution, the government can be controlled, their employees can be controlled by their uh, rational will in the Constitution itself. That was separation of powers. But separation of powers was only an auxiliary precaution. The main precaution, the main reliance in Republican government is on elections. We sometimes forget that. And it's elections where political parties come in. As Will says, I think correctly, parties threaten to combine the separated powers, especially the, the legislature and the executive, together to subvert separation to that extent and to set up a new conspiracy against the public, undermining bicameralism and presidential independence by making the president's selection depend increasingly on caucuses in the legislature. This is actually what happened uh, after um, uh, 1800 and before the emergence of national political parties uh, with uh, conventions to select the presidential uh, nomination. Um, this subversion of separation would allow the government to become master of the Constitution rather than the Constitution being the master of the government. It would, in effect, have made us a kind of parliamentary or quasi-parliamentary system where the parliament has, in some, not in every sense, not in every case, but in many cases, has the authority to change the Constitution through ordinary statutory uh, means. So how to preserve separation of powers and the spirit of the Constitution as 
the institutions of political parties began to be added to our politics. One constitutional change was needed, the 12th Amendment, uh, to keep presidential selection in the people's hands uh, rather than allowing the Electoral College to deadlock as it had in 1800 and throwing the election every time uh, <coughs> to the uh, House of Representatives and to par party caucuses. Um, but there was another change, uh, an informal change needed as well. And, and that was to make the institution of political parties serve the Constitution and its separated powers rather than try to overcome them. And that was the achievement in the post-Jacksonian period um, of uh, Martin Van Buren and others who created the first two-party system in America. Uh, parties had existed, of course, throughout the 1790s, and there had been a big showdown in the election of 1800, but both parties in the 1790s regarded party as an emergency device that was not going to operate in ordinary times. It was needed to rescue the Constitution from its enemies, they thought. Uh, it was an innovation of the 1820s, 1830s, more particularly, uh, to conceive of two-party competition publicly, respectably, as a, an essential component of democracy, a sort of completion of the constitutional system, because you could, to the extent, you could pit the parties against each other uh, c to competing as guardians of the Union and the Constitution. Now, the most incisive critic of this system uh, was John C. Calhoun, uh, who argued that neither Madison's system of separated powers nor the post-Madisonian party system would actually prevent majority tyranny. That could only be achieved by redefining the nature of the Union and the Constitution away from what uh, Calhoun called the numerical majority to the, what he called the concurrent majority, which would be based not on individual rights or individual natural equality and rights, but on the equality and liberty of social groups, in this case, American states, and within the states, the white race. Now, I, I submit that our contemporary polarization stems from a new attitude towards separation of powers, political parties, and the Constitution introduced a hundred years ago, more or less, by American progressives. In the 19th century, American statesmen had tried to bring the parties into harmony with the Constitution and its separation of powers. But Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson and other progressives set out to use parties explicitly to overcome the separation of powers and the whole spirit of Madison's complicated constitutionalism. This um, uh, amazing and important uh, uh, reversal of understanding, Wilson did in the name of a new concept which he called the living constitution. And uh, Wilson is the first American president to use the term the living constitution. And it did not mean, it was not for him just a judicial philosophy or a question of, you know, that arises when Supreme Court judges are up for confirmation. It was an attitude to the whole Constitution, executive, legislative, and judicial. Um, it, it had, I will say very quickly, two components to it at least. One was that the president would become the leader of public opinion, and through public opinion was going to be leading Congress, not as a co-equal branch, but as the branch in charge. Uh, the, the purpose of parties would be reorganized around the president's own charisma, his personal force, his ability to seize the imagination of the public and thus bring public opinion to bear against uh, the Congress. That's a new conception of political parties and it was a, uh, it, it's still I think basically the leading conception of parties uh, today. In the 19th century, the presidential candidates were inferior to the parties. Nowadays, they essentially are the parties uh, or are in the driving seat of the parties. And the other great development which began 100 years ago was not only this change in the nature of presidential leadership and party leadership, but, a, but of course the growth of the administrative state, that is the delegation of legislative powers to administrative agencies and the gradual eclipse of Congress 
by re regulatory agencies. As you know, nowadays, the, by far the greater number of laws that are actually made in America are not made by elected representatives, but are made by uh, unelected um, civil servants in the agencies. So at first, the 20th century progressives reassured Americans that the two constitutions, the living constitution and the original constitution, Madison's, were convergent that the living constitution was what the organized constitution had been all along. Underneath the textbook theory, the reality had been this. That was one argument. The other was uh, slightly different, that, that the living constitution was what was emerging out of the original constitution as it came into contact with modernity, with the rapid pace of social and economic change. In other words, the living constitution was sold in a way as a means of keeping the original constitution up to date, of keeping it alive. And this was Wilson's sort of Darwinian account of, uh, uh, of it. And it was in a way uh, not, not far from the reality. For the first 50 or 60 years um, of, the, of the living constitution, it, the divergences between it and the literal constitution, the original constitution, were not that great. But gradually, the divergences built up, became apparent, and the admirers of the original Constitution became disenthralled of their illusions about the new, and something unexpected happened. Uh, unexpected, that is, by the progressives. And what happened was the, that the case for the original Constitution underwent an intellectual and political rebirth. Uh, the progressives had assumed all along that the plutocracy would defend the old constitution, but they had never imagined that the moral and intellectual case for it could be renewed or could be rehabilitated. But that isn't exactly what began to happen. Uh, under many different names, originalism, natural law jurisprudence, uh, the new institutionalism, there are many schools uh, that contributed to this resurgence. The living constitution was revealed at that moment as a choice, not a destiny uh, or an inevitability. And it was when that surrender was called off that the, what uh, my journal, the Claremont Review, calls the Cold Civil War began. Uh, and so I, I'll leave you on this. I wonder if our current polarization might not be explained by a real choice, latent but becoming increasingly explicit in our politics between two conflicting constitutions, the liberals constitution and the conservatives, the living constitution and the limited one, as Hamilton called it, or the constitution of historical right and the constitution of natural right. One seeks to use our politics, including political parties, to overcome the original constitution, including its separation of powers. The other strives, very haphazardly, alas, to use politics to restore the original Constitution as far as circumstances will permit. Thank you. Okay, I think now we're cooking with gas. Mark, are you ready? <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> when I was invited to participate in this, I said, this uh, conference, I said I'd be happy to, although I really didn't have any distinctive expertise in the uh, subjects that were going to be discussed. Uh, and then in the, and I'd been thinking that for most of yesterday, and then two sessions ago, there was um, an exchange initiated by Bill Goldston and Genevieve Lake here, uh, where I said to myself, oh, that's something I know something about. So I want to, I'll, I'll start <laughs> with, with that, uh, which is the, sort of a general observation, Genevieve called it the uh, New Deal settlement, it, it, it is that um, where there's, reasonable disagreement among people about, in the first instance, what good public policy is. The strong presumption is that that disagreement will be settled by politics. Uh, um, my second step is to say, well, if there's reasonable disagreement with people about, among people about what the meaning of the Constitution is, that too should be settled presumptively uh, by politics. Uh, and then Genevieve said correctly that um, in the New Deal period, people said, well, yeah, presumptively, but the presumption can be overcome if we can identify defects in the democratic process such that we can't really trust the outcome of the 
uh, of the process, and, and then the lesson of everything up to that point in the conversation was, well, what do you do when there's reasonable disagreement about the proposition that there is a defect in the democratic process? Now, my position is, you know, resolve that by politics. The general presumption that you resolve these things by politics prevails when there's reasonable disagreement, in some sense, all the way down. Okay, so what, what the implication of that is for the conversations that we've been having is uh, what, what you get out of that is uh, you resolve issues about partisan gerrymandering through political mechanisms and you resolve issues about strict regulation of campaign financing through uh, uh, political mechanisms. Now, as you can imagine, there's a very small constituency for that position. Right, uh, because and and in some sense, understandably so, uh, because partisans on each of those issues want to say, well, yeah, we can win on some of those issues, like, uh, but we'll lose on others, and when we lose on them, we want to get the courts to come in and say, well, you know, the Constitution says uh, what the solution should be, um, and so the only way to to make the position that I think is the correct one stick is if you can get the judges to agree to it. And uh, uh, the only way, judges can't cut deals. Uh, the only way to uh, make this idea stick is through what I, I guess it's Habermas calls the force of the better argument. Now, I made this argument wasn't original with me, but I made it in 1980. Um, I tweaked it in 1988. I tweak it a little more today. Uh, but the very fact that, you know, I would have to keep making the argument suggests that, at the very least, it hasn't carried the force of the better <laughs> argument. Um, and so we're where we are. Um, I myself still think that the argument is correct. And that we just ought to, you know, resolve all these things at some level, all of these things through political contention. Um, I know my side would lose a chunk of the issues that would come up, uh, and my side would win some of the issues that would come up. I'm okay with that. Uh, lots of people on my side of the political spectrum are not okay with losing that. Okay, now let me go to the stuff that I don't know very much about. Um, and I want to pick up on uh, something that Fernita Tolson introduced yesterday, which was thinking about what was happening before, 19, before 1860. And my description of it would be, uh, in the 1840s and 1850s, there was a, a reconfiguration of the party system, uh, symbolized by the fact that in the 1860 election, there were four major presidential candidates. Um, and uh, I think I want to put on the table the proposition that we may be facing uh, a new reconfiguration of the party system in a way that uh, puts under pressure the assumption that runs through most of the discussions that we've had that the existing two-party structure is stable and going to be the framework within which all of these issues, including the separation of parties rather than powers, uh, get resolved. So let me just try to focus that by a speculative, probably not likely to occur, but not fantastic proposition, uh, which is that one could imagine without too much difficulty the existence of four serious presidential candidates in the 2020 election call one the rep representative of establishment Republicans or the John Kasich party, uh, set the, uh, another the Trump Republicans, uh, third representative of the establishment Democrats, and fourth representative of the Sanders, and I have this in quotation marks, Democrats, because if Sanders actually wanted to do it, he could say, honestly enough, he never said he was a Demo member of the Democratic Party. <laughs> He's going to run as a Democratic Socialist. Um, and so, okay, so put that particular point aside, you, you would have, it's plausible to think that there were people 
political entrepreneurs who imagine the possibility of representing, running for president as, as the head of each of those four parties. Uh, uh, now, let me say some things about that. First of all, I'm talking about this at the, as a, at the presidential level. Um, doing this as a full-scale party, it's probably already too late to do it. And the reconfiguration that occurred in the 1840s and 1850s took you know, 10, 12 years, not the two that we have now. Um, second uh, observation is, um, are there rules that in place that would obstruct the, uh, the emergence of this kind of new party system? Um, and the natural response is to say, well, you know, we know that third parties don't succeed uh, directly, and they don't have elect direct electoral success. Um, uh, four parties might be different, actually. Uh, uh, and in particular, you can imagine the John Kasich Republicans saying, well, you know, we can beat the Trump Republicans and the Democrats and the two Democrats who are running. That's the Dem Democrats are going to divide their votes too. So we can beat them in you know, the industrial Midwest. The Trump Republicans will beat the three of, of us in the South, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it might be that with four parties of this sort, the experience of the three party, the third parties, is not quite as relevant as, as you might think it would be. Another point which is uh, tied to the pre-1860 example, one that I've already suggested, which is the four parties in the 1860s were able to, uh, it, it, before 1860, were able to exist because of regional concentration. Um, I've already hinted at the possibility of regional concentration with respect to these four uh, configurations. So, you know, again, I'm not saying this is likely, but it wouldn't be crazy for an entrepreneurial politician to make the calculation that, you know, that this might be the way to go. Um, third point is there are uh, practices independent of the rules and in particular financing practices of the sort that May personally mentioned uh, in his uh, presentation uh, that might affect the ability to organize uh, the four-party system. Um, uh, uh, yes, uh, maybe, uh, but there may be, if there are entrepreneurial politicians, there may be entrepreneurial investors and politicians who would uh, assist in the financing of this. Uh, final point on this is, um, I've talked about this at the presidential level and the reconfiguration that occurred before 1860 occurred in the first instance, I think, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but I think it occurred in the first instance at the state and local levels and in, through congressional uh, elections and so on, and then crystallized in the 1860 election. And so you have to think about how John Kasich, Bernie Sanders, you know, the four people I have in mind, uh, uh, would, would uh, organize these parties uh, at the at the state and Senate levels. Um, and you know, there, are, there are startup costs uh, that would uh, have to be incurred. And that's why I say it may be already too late to do this, because the startup costs you know, might have to be incurring those now in order to put the mechanisms in place to run. Um, uh, the people, who, these politicians I have in mind, uh, probably are going to imagine uh, that they could run in primaries and win some of the primaries and so on. Uh, and then they'd face uh, uh, problems of um, the sore losers laws that were mentioned earlier uh, and so on. And they'd run up against existing doctrine uh, that is, uh, as I suggested earlier, predicated on the stability of the now existing uh, party configuration, which met that doctrinal structure may fit the current circumstances badly. So there are lots of obstacles to this. And, and finally, there might well be intra-party anticipatory responses that would, in some sense, you know, cut the knees out from under two of these potential candidates. Okay, so 
I'm not saying this is going to happen, but you know, we're in a situation where it's, as I said, not fantastic. The implications for the separation of powers, and this is what I'll uh, end on, is that if there were four parties, it would actually it would reopen the possibility of uh, coalition governments that have we've talked about that uh, several uh, times already. Uh, again, in Bill Galson's initial presentation, he said that we might have to tinker with or adjust Senate rules and House rules to deal with how this kind of coalition government might what might, might, might might work, uh, but if coalition government reemerged, not as coalitions uh, crossing, not as bipartisan coalitions, but as coalitions among separately defined parties, uh, we might actually return to the classic separation of powers kinds of ideas that uh, Rick says are displaced by the existing party system, uh, we would always have divided government, uh, uh, but it, it wouldn't be the hyper-polarized kind of party government uh, that we now have, uh, and therefore the classic idea of uh, the separation of powers rather than the separation of parties uh, might, uh, might operate effectively. Thank you, Mark. Paul? Huh? Yeah. So yesterday, uh, Mike McConnell began the conference with a, a look back to the view of the founding generation that virtuous leaders were essential to sound government. And that hope for uh, public virtue was not without a knowledge of human psychology on the part of the framers, uh, including but not limited to Madison. And so in writings like Federalist 51, the ambition and desire for reputation of individuals was to be used to channel and constrain self-regarding behavior, to attach it to office, and to direct it toward the public good. And we've spent two days talking about how that did not happen. Uh, so for those who like conferences to have a certain element of kind of narrative closure, it's fitting that I end by arguing for something like the return of that vision, uh, maybe in a different way than Professor Kessler. Uh, despite political parties and their effect on that design. And I have to say, especially after two days of political scientists, I mean, not even the, the theorists, you know, if the theorists were here, they'd just tell me I was wrong, but they wouldn't demand a data set, right? But after, after two days of that, um, and, and historians who I greatly admire, you know, I was feeling progressively more embarrassed to make such a kind of romantic argument for a return of this vision, but, uh, and I was, going to describe it as kind of a pleasant bedtime story before going off after a long conference. But Will has really kind of energized me in, with this Harry Potter uh, metaphor. So now I can think of this uh, little talk as being kind of Harry Potter and the constitutional tripod, which, you know, much better, right? Still um, uh, fiction, but um, things turn out pretty well for him in the end, more or less. So I want to talk about three concepts, hence the tripod office, oath, and honor that should work together to provide something like a virtuous world of office holding relevant to each branch and to interbranch relations. Um, I wanted to be on this panel because uh, Rick, uh, with his co-author Daryl Levinson, has indeed presented some very good criticisms of this view, and I wanted to be exposed to the kind of cold light of reality. It seems, as I said, like a foolish view at the end of two days of this, but um, Harry Potter. Uh, and then close with a, a few words, maybe, about how this should be relevant to judges, although I don't want to be too court-centric uh, about it. So I'm somewhat haltingly at work at a, on a book about oaths in the Constitution. Um, and I'm sure Judge Callahan would tell you she remembers taking her constitutional and judicial oaths, and that she doesn't take them lightly. Uh, but it's a common and reasonable assumption that, as a culture, we don't honor oaths the way that we used to do. For that matter, we don't honor honor the way that we once did. Oaths are often seen as antiquated. Honor has famously been called obsolete, replaced by dignity as the primary understanding of human beings and their status. To the extent that we still value these things, and we do, and not just in Broadway musicals, we recognize that human nature regularly falls short of these ideals and institutions 
and that they're subject to counter pressures, including but not limited to political parties and political polarization. And of course, there are good reasons for us to value dignity and to worry about honor with its very mixed history. On the other hand, a potential downside of a dignity-based culture is that it lacks a thick set of incentives and motivations. As Sharon Krauss writes in her wonderful book, Liberalism with Honor, we need something that encourages individual agency and energy and provides a spring for public regarding action, especially difficult and costly or risky action, often in the face of contrary pressures. Uh, and in my telling, there are three interrelated institutions in the Constitution and constitutional culture that both provide this motivation and then channel and constrain it. Those are, again, office, oath, and honor. The concept of attachment to office stretches well back before the Federalist and the founding era to writers like Cicero, on whom many of the framers drew. Uh, and the vision of office there is not about power, uh, and certainly not of power as a roving commission to act, but one of obligation or duty. The office holder must fit himself or herself to the office and act within the meets and bounds of that specific office. Obviously, office does not transform one into a Solon or Solomon, or divest a person of human frailty. Um, and this was well understood uh, by everybody writing about office. As they also understood, however, even if we select virtuous uh, individuals to occupy these offices, they won't maintain those virtues without powerful motivations. Ambition and a desire for glory are one such motivation. The love of fame, which Hamilton famously called the ruling passion of the noblest minds. I don't know whether that made it into the lyrics of the show or not. Um, these are not virtues in themselves. Uh, they can lead to bad or good results. They must be channeled productively. And the quality that does so is the love of honor. Honor, properly understood, is not just outward looking. It's not merely the desire for fame. It's the desire to be thought well of by those whose opinion ought to matter and to deserve to be thought well of by those individuals. It's both inward looking and outward looking. At its best, it demands honor in the eyes of those individuals who are worthy to confer it. And it involves an internalization of the, this desire and of the virtues that ought to accompany earned honor. Adam Smith wrote that it involves not just a desire for approval, but a desire of being what ought to be approved of. So it's both more and less than a virtue. It's a motivation and a spur to virtuous conduct that becomes internalized as a desire to act virtuously and be understood to do so. That quality may be more rather than less necessary in an egalitarian democratic society. In that society, um, we still need some basis for the personal agency that can bring out qualities like boldness, courage, the willingness to stand for office, and strength of character in the face of contrary pressures. Um, honor has been viewed in modern liberal democratic societies with suspicion, especially as contrasted with the value of dignity. But demanding honor of our highest officials and honoring them for those virtues is not incompatible with a belief in equal human dignity. Rather, we may need honor in order to maintain a legal and political regime in which human dignity is defended and advanced. In our constitutional system, the device that serves to tie individual honor to office is the oath. The oath takes, uh, serves multiple functions. It's a prerequisite and a perf uh, performative act for taking office. It solemnizes the act of taking office, commits the oath taker to fulfill the duties of office and observe its limits. And it's a public act which calls on the oath taker to maintain the approval and avoid the disapproval of both the wider public and also of his or her peer or honor group. Of course, it is not a magical device either, but it can or should be a powerful device, a linchpin connecting the individual to the office and the office holder to the commitment to act honorably. In that way, it provides a deeply personal motive 
and spring for the commitment to honorable performance of one's office and properly channeled attachment to one's uh, oath and branch. Um, that these qualities are aspirational and often incompletely fulfilled does not make them less important. So one answer to this is a cynical one. The answer at the end of the sun also rises. Isn't it pretty to think so? Uh, and especially, as I said, after two days of political scientists, one can feel especially uh, brazen in making an argument uh, like this. Um, and there's no question that there are many factors recognized since the beginning of our history as a nation, uh, or yours since I'm a, a Canadian, um, that, uh, that we can think about, uh, including parties, that complicate this story. Uh, not least, changes in our culture in which honor is not uh, on respected even in the breach, let alone the observance, but is thought of as a superseded value. And obviously we can add uh, political parties as one of those factors. So I, I don't want to dodge these questions. I certainly don't want to ignore their existence. They pose a serious challenge to anyone who wants to argue for something like an honor or oath-based or virtue-based uh, view of high office. Um, Unfortunately, well, I should say I'm positive I have a complete answer to those questions, but unfortunately time prevents me from presenting all of them here. <laughs> and I already said I'm a Canadian, so that was an example of deadpan humor, just to be clear. Uh, but I do want to say two uh, slightly qualified things in defense of this vision. And the first is normative uh, and a little proselytizing, and that's that there is still a great deal of value uh, to this vision. Kenji Yoshino has written that the Madisonian vision in Federalist 51 is at once too cynical and too naive. So the finest legal literature uh, now, thanks to uh, Rick and Daryl, uh, is full of versions of the Madison is too naive argument. So I think there's uh, some room for a let's not be too cynical argument. Um, and I don't think this is a question of, uh, of being simplistic, uh, rather, uh, or of seeing this as an easy thing to achieve. Rather, the, the troika of oath, honor, and office are intertwined, interdependent, and especially dependent on a larger set of cultural values, uh, which really uh, we don't necessarily possess right now. So this kind of project requires not only the revival of honor, but also its adaptation to a different, to a more democratic and dignitarian culture in a way that treats dignity as a basic floor, a feature of all human beings, while celebrating greatness of spirit and seeing failures of duty or compliance with party or ideological interests over the duties and obligations of office as shameful. That's uh, hardly a straightforward or easy thing to achieve. But I don't think these concepts have passed out of our values and vocabulary altogether. And they're worth uh, rethinking and reviving. The second observation, and this will be very brief, is that we're not utterly lacking in a more modern technology or vocabulary for achieving some of the revival that I advocate here, at least in some places or some forms. There's room for some designs that encourage institutional loyalty and tie it to sounder performance in office. And rather than spell these out, I will simply say, uh, point you to a useful recent article on the subject, Institutional Loyalties in Constitutional Law by David Fontana and Aziz Hook. Uh, it's more technocratic in its approach than any romantic talk of office uh, or oath uh, or honor, but it's uh, also more practical and suggestive that there are ways to encourage honorable identification with office and with loyalty to one's oath, and I certainly commend it. Um, given time, I won't say too much about this. I'll just add a couple of sentences, and if people want to follow up during questions, that's fine. Uh, I said I would talk about the role for courts. I think the role is one of nudging um, not of uh, pushing this for project forward in any dramatic way. Um, what I think courts can do is nudge other branches to act in ways that are more consistent with uh, a certain Publian vision of um, the offices and how those branches should perform. 
Uh, but of course, talking about the revival of honor and the oath are as relevant to judges and courts as they are to the other branches. So they should not be spared uh, this uh, uh, project or inquiry. Um, and for the most part, obviously, something like the revival of honor is a, a cultural project and so well beyond the remit of the courts. Thank you, Paul. Well, you used the word romantic twice, so I think you may have given away how you described yourself. <laughs> I want to. I want to thank you all for setting the stage. I, I want to go back to. Um, the, I want to go back to the Constitution, and I want to go back to all the things that we've talked about that are impediments to getting things done with the various branches of government, and uh, whether it's divided or whether it's unified government. But really, where does the Constitution fit into all of this? And I think Rick's article posits a functional approach to the judiciary's check on the executive power, where the political branches are unified under one party. Courts might be more willing to invalidate presidential actions that expand presidential powers because a politically aligned Congress could pass the necessary legislation that achieves the same objective. And then conversely, the courts could uh, consider increased accommodation of executive action in times of divided government as uh, congressional legislation is less likely under those conditions. But I guess my broader question is, does the Constitution permit such an approach? Does it permit a sliding scale relative to whether it's divided or unified government or whether where the other branches are not getting anything done? I've always thought a little bit of the Constitution as setting out in Article 1, 2, and 3 exactly what powers went with each branch. And then if you want to be, uh, if you want to color within the lines, then you're following what the Constitution says. And so I'm curious about where we're advocating maybe coloring outside the lines, what um, what you may think would justify that. Is it a progressive view of the Constitution, or is it really allowed under the Constitution, or is it allowed by the times? And so, Rick, I'm going to start with you, because you kind of set our foundation. OK, thanks very much. Um, so uh, first, I guess, let me say that uh, I was uh, primarily interested in conveying the, the descriptive account uh, of how much our system has changed over time because of the development of political parties first and then the development of hyperpolarized parties and how we need to rethink the way we think about various eras, eras of political practice and, and legal doctrine. Uh, and in then trying to work out are there normative implications from this, uh, I, you know, certainly meaning to be provocative uh, and uh, creative in raising possibilities for how we might think about judicial review uh, in constitutional cases or in statutory cases or administrative law cases. So I don't want to oversell the normative side. I don't want to get boxed into you know, being too hard line about this more than I actually mean to be. But, but I do want to say that I think you know, despite the, the kind of question you asked and some of the questions that Will raised, um, it's very clear American courts have, in some context, shifted legal doctrine over time based on different assessments of how various public institutions are performing. So I mean, the easiest example is from the administrative law area, not the constitutional area. But there's no question that when there was a dramatic change in the view of how administrative agencies functioned, when in the 1960s there was the emergence of a fair amount of political consensus that agencies were no longer to be thought of as the kind of expert technocrats, uh, but were much more easily captured by the regulated actors, uh, that courts developed the hard look doctrine in administrative law and became much more aggressive about reviewing agency action precisely in response to that changed set of perceptions. Uh, you know, similarly, Will alluded to fed federal court doctrine uh, and the very different ways the Supreme Court treated the state courts uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s than the way they came to treat the state courts in the post, you know, 
80s or so era. Uh, now, let's talk about the presidency and how the court has changed judicial doctrine with respect to the presidency. Uh, I think the, the most celebrated case in the canon of separation of powers, the steel, steel seizure case, um, has many opinions, including the Justice Jackson opinion, uh, that is the most cited, that I think are very much affected by this institutionally realist judgment about how the presidency has changed and how to look, in, look at the presidency in the aftermath of the rise of totalitarian governments and the, and the fight in World War II. So for example, J Jackson very explicitly says, the president is now the head of a party system. He can work his will through the legislature in a way he couldn't before because of that. He commands the national attention in a way that presidents in the 19th century didn't. And I think that when Jackson starts applying his very elusive tripartite framework, and you start trying to characterize whether the president is acting in the face of prohibition by Congress, silence by Congress, or authorization, I think that he tilts against finding congressional authorization, where I think he could have from the statutes, partly because of these facts. But Felix Frankfurter, in that opinion, says, in his separate opinion, says something like, it is hard to see in the, I can't capture the language, the son of a haberdasher from Missouri or the fertile soil of Missouri, a dictator, blah, blah. And that's exactly what he's seeing, or that's the risk that he's seeing in the presidency after World War II. And I think part of the reason he votes the way that he does. Um, I think that the, I'll stop here with this point, but I think uh, the way the Supreme Court treated the cases out of Guantanamo uh, late in the post 9-11 era, when the court finally became involved, uh, overturning, in my view, doctrine from the post-World War II period uh, about the issue, for example, of habeas in Guantanamo and whether it applied, where Justice O'Connor writes, the war is not a blank check for presidential power. I find it hard not to see that decision to intervene in that area in that way as being unaffected by what was widely understood at the time, which is the very expansive claims about unilateral Article II executive power that was being, that were, was being made by the Bush administration, apart from the specifics of that case. Well, before so, I let you move off. No, well, that's there. it. No, I'm, gonna, I'm yeah. not going to let you off yet. Oh. Um, because I, I kind of want to set the stage for as we go down. Because another, um, you write a lot of articles. Um, so, uh, and, I'll and try to write fewer program. going forward. Well, in, you, in another one of your articles, you assert that gerrymandered districts exacerbate the ideological divide between the two major political parties. And that the Supreme Court's going to soon decide whether political gerrymandering runs afoul of the First Amendment or the Equal Protection Clause, and whether the ju judiciary is equipped to adjudicate such disputes. So I'm sort of curious if your view of uh, James Madison's um, constitutional design accommodate judicial review of challenges to partisan gerrymandering. So we, because we're going to get into all of this, and so we're not only talking about how we draw the lines, but what's I can't even say this word, it's just a judici judiciable, <laughs> you know, what they should be deciding. Um, well, I, I think, you know, most of American constitutional history probably isn't consistent with, with whatever Madison might have thought about what the role of the courts would be. But certainly, with respect to the, what I call the law of democracy, or what Sam and I call the law of democracy, every single thing the Supreme Court has done in this area starting with the development of the one, folk, one person doctrine and the end of malapportionment, to the development of the understanding that the right to vote was to be treated as a fundamental right under the 14th Amendment and strict scrutiny would be applied to severe burdens on the right to vote, to treating matters of political party affiliation as protected by the First Amendment, and the right of association, which also is not directly in the First Amendment. All of the law of democracy is as non-originalist as any area of jurisprudence that we have. And it would not be, I mean, in that context, the, the originalist question about how to deal with partisan gerrymandering, um, you know, uh, is one I find hard to, to kind of answer except by pointing to, to that body of law. But 
to respond to Mark's skepticism about whether courts should do something in that area, I mean, it's easy to imagine you know, scenarios. The legislature currently in power says, we stay in power unless the other side gets 45%. I mean, we stay in power if we get 45% of the vote or more. Or we stay in power if we get 35% of the vote or more. I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which legislatures can entrench themselves in power and to just appeal to the political process itself to cure these problems when you have to go through exactly the jerry-rigged framework that one party in power, whether through the design of election districts or through rules like this, has created, uh, does strike me as a pretty profound democratic uh, defect. Now, whether there's consensus on that, um, I don't know. Um, I do hope the court does something uh, to intervene in the area of partisan gerrymandering. Um, I think it's a pathology of American democracy. Um, I think the courts are not going to probably do anything that's major. Um, that's not the ultimate place for this problem to be solved effectively. But and anyway, that's my answer to your question about partisan well, gerrymandering. It, what you all can't see that's really fun about this is the expressions on people's faces exactly as we go up and down. So, Will? <laughs> uh, where to start? Uh, I, I guess I, I, I can't help but comment on the originals and the law of democracy point. I think it's right uh, that it's probably one of the least originalist areas of well-entrenched doctrine. And the one person, one vote quest uh, is, is right. I think it's worth noting that sort of an originalist approach to the Constitution's law of democracy is not so much something that we tried and found wanting as uh, never managed to try at all. So I think it was yesterday that, uh, maybe it was Pam, mentioned Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, which is designed to impose severe incentives on states not to disenfranchise people. Uh, Congress briefly flirted with trying to, impo to enforce that in the 1870 and 1880 censuses and discovered, A, it was really hard, uh, and B, the first time they tried to do it, it looked like Massachusetts would lose some seats, and nobody thought that was a good idea, so they just kind of gave up and moved on. The 15th Amendment went through a long period of not being enforced, and then we sort of countered with other things. So, so I think that's all true. I, I do think it's interesting to, to ask what would have happened if we tried to actually uh, take the Constitution seriously. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, on the first point, I think, I think also Rick is right that, that I probably overstated the degree to which courts are allergic to institutional realism. I think it does creep into a lot of things the courts do. I never liked Justice Jackson's opinion in Youngstown, uh, and now I have a good way to articulate why. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I think the formalism of Justice Black's opinion, which is the actual opinion for the court, uh, you know, is one that endures a lot more. I do think it's worth also drawing a distinction between what courts do or what judges do in their heart of hearts and what they say and how they shape the doctrine. So I have no doubt that judges can't help but be influenced by what they see in the world around them and that administrative law can't help but be shaped with the judges sort of intuitive skepticism or not of administrative agencies. I do think it's something else to explicitly reshape the doctrine on that basis and therefore invite other judges to, to make those kinds of realistic factors part of the law, as opposed to just something that, that works in the law in the edges. Uh, and I think that's where I, get, where I get more nervous. Charles? Well, <clears throat> I would say um, there's considerable play in the joints uh, in, in separation of powers and in federalism uh, in Madison's argument in the Federalist. Uh, I mean, he says quite explicitly that thing, you know, what, if, if the public finds that um, the federal government is administered with much greater uh, efficiency and honesty and so forth than the state governments, then they will kick some things upstairs to the feds from state functions. I mean, there's a, there's a legal aspect of federalism. There's also a political aspect. And I think the same is, is true of separation of powers as well. There's a legal component. There's a minimum of sorts. But, but there is a great deal of political um, flexibility uh, left and M Madison himself illustrates this when he changes his mind on the national bank uh, from thinking it unconstitutional to deciding that it, uh, it, it is constitutional and it wasn't such a bad idea um, after all. So I, I, I think the, the formalism of the doctrines in, uh, uh, shouldn't be overestimated uh, as they actually come into, into political life. Uh, in the 18th century, and so that would su suggest to me that that some of the flexibility uh, Rick is seeking is already there uh, in the institutions and in the the uh, 
even the theory of the institutions. Mark? Uh, I guess I, just two points. One, one in response directly to, to Rick. Uh, in, in all my formulations, I said there had to be reasonable disagreement about the various propositions. Uh, now, we can have a conversation about how much weight we can give to the idea of reasonableness, but at some point, you know, a 20 percent victory is, is it's unreasonable to think that that's representative of the people. Um, if 45 percent in a context where people make reasonable arguments about uh, fraudulent voting, um, who knows? Uh, I would want to have that kind of conversation. Um, and I guess I'm sort of willing to say if we have that conversation and the evidence is not really there to support the claim that there is substantial amounts of fraudulent voting, um, the people will figure out that that's the, uh, that's a, a, it would be a mistake to do that. Um, on, on Will's point about, you know, articulated doctrine and uh, what was in the judge's heart, I, I, do, I, I do sort of, you know, I've done a lot of work on the development of administrative law in the 1930s. Um, and you know, the, the judges who were doing that were uh, quite good lawyers. And so the, it was not references to administrative law as a, a response to problems of modernity, not something they say. Theorists say that. But judges say, well, let's look at the five cases that are most relevant. And you can see that when you put these five cases together, you get a result that the theorists say is responsive to modernity. Um, and I'm, they're happy about that. But uh, <laughs> they, they, the judges, are happy about that because that's what's in their heart. But the articulated doctrine doesn't say that. So I, I'm not sure that saying you, you want to pay attention to how they articulate the doctrine, only want to pay attention to how they articulate the doctrine is going to get away from the problem of uh, uh, being institutionally realist. Pa? Yeah, so um, I won't use the institutional realism frame, because I kind of already, we all had to accept one frame, uh, you know, for the panel. So um, so I'll, I'll still talk in terms of virtue or, or character. Um, so um, for the most part, um, uh, I would not um, expect judges, if I thought that there were serious concerns about the, uh, the kind of cultural surround of elected officials um, uh, that did not conduce to their honorable or virtuous behavior, then I would not necessarily trust um, judges to be the ones to, to nudge them into place. But I do think um, there are cases where there are arguable departures uh, from that model where judges can take a role. Um, they don't need to put it in those terms. You know, this is not an, a sufficiently virtuous president, but they can do things that kind of nudge a branch into more proper action. So there's a recent, and this, I know you're thinking about this, John. Um, well, so is recent, that under the Constitution, or is that just a good idea? No, no, I think, well, um, yes, it's under the Constitution uh, or under the statute. Or I never saw a nudge in the Constitution, right. so I'm so let me, just let me curious it, about that. Let me put it uh, in these terms. I'll, I'll first kind of provide the extreme example. and then kind of, um, So uh, in a recent article, Sandy Levinson and Mark Graber argued that where you have what they call an anti- Publian president. The court should basically subject everything that that president does to strict scrutiny. They happen to have a particular president in mind who they <laughs> think of as utterly uh, lacking in virtue and character. Um, what I think you can do reasonably as a, as a court, um, I mean, with the legal materials available to you, is look for where there is ambiguity or uncertainty about the constitutionality of an action by a branch. Look for evidence of sound reason giving, sound consultation, interbranch uh, consultation, or intra-branch consultation. And where that's lacking, you may well send um, that legal action back to the drawing board. Um, I'm thinking here of, for instance, an executive order 
<clears throat> that's drafted in the West Wing and where the president cuts everybody else out of the process, you can say there are uncertainties about this or there are outright um, uh, due process problems with it. Um, but they can go back and... You find the hook. Uh, so you find the hook and what you say is provide sounder reasons, provide a sounder process, one that is consistent with you're not acting um, will of the wisp, but um, acting in a way that's consistent with reason deliberation. And then they may come back and give you uh, a still lousy policy that's had the rough edges sounded off because reasonable people in government have been consulted on it. And then at some point you take yes for an answer and say, as it were, that is now a sufficiently Publian process or law, um, even if we don't happen to like the policy. I can say that does happen in judging. So I, I want to move and I want to talk about Trump versus Hawaii. Um, we've been talking about things that divide people. That's the travel ban case for anyone that doesn't, that doesn't know that. And it involves the Supreme Court's longstanding jurisprudence recognizing the near plenary power of the president to exclude immigrants. Those cases stretch back at least to the 1950s, for example, Shaughnessy versus the United States. XL Maasai, a time when the political party's ideological cohesion was less pronounced. In our current area, where party loyalty and cohesion appear to be at their zenith and the president and congressional majority are of the same party, should the judiciary take a more active role in checking executive power when it comes to issues like national security and immigration. So um, recognizing that, and I, I think this is something that we also discussed, I think you can incorporate into that when we're talking about it, is whether you think that the parties of the justices are going to be a factor in deciding this case. Who wants to start? <laughs> I have to call on someone for. I don't think I'll it's start. Uh, okay. uh, just in the sense the that man I mean, from I just, Toronto. Right. Uh, yeah, I do have a certain interest in this. Um, so, but I, I mean, I just told the travel ban story. In a you sense, have to get right? your citizen patient papers in, right? Especially, uh, as I said, because they're. Um, I believe the proposal right now is to allow access to social media history, which really I need to get get ahead of that uh, storm. I think, but. Um, in any event, um, I mean, the story I told, I think, was the travel ban story. You have a uh, first round um, that, in particular, um, cut out a lot of responsible office holders, I mean, loyal, um, institutionally identified office holders within the executive branch, cut them out of the uh, consultative process, or at least so it was uh, reported. Um, and forcing the White House, in effect, to go back and uh, extend its deliberations and policy making so that it provided reasons, tweaked the order, uh, dealt with people uh, throughout that branch who had more expertise. Um, I do think that is the kind of nudging that courts can and should do and that makes the process, again, it may still be a policy that I am not fond of, um, and it might still be unconstitutional for other reasons, uh, but it makes it a more acceptably, um, mm -hmm. I guess, Madisonian or, or consistent with the kind of uh, Madisonian government at that well, point. Well, but in the particular case that I read the mm -hmm. transcript of argument, I mean, part of the issue that CERT was granted on is, number one, is whether it's justi justiciable, mm -hmm. because they're talking about national security and whether it can even be reviewed. So you have that. So um, if I were to be a betting person, I would probably say the court's going to say they can look at it. But then when you get to the next point, some of the questions, if you uh, probably the, the strongest questions in terms of, and I, if you're talking party of the justices, and I'm just l looking at the oral, I'm, you know, uh, oral argument, um, I think Ginsburg, Kagan, and Sotomayor were talking about, well, isn't this just something that Congress does? What can the president even get into this area? Um, Breyer seemed to be a bit, I think he was a bit slushy. And then on the other justices, either didn't ask questions too much or uh, seemed to be more on the side of uh, uh, 
there's exec that the that it's within uh, that there's executive power here involved because uh, Will, do you want to talk about this? Uh, yeah, a couple thoughts. So I do think it's uh, predictable and unfortunate that there's a kind of uh, reshuffling of who on the court is in favor of executive power and immigration uh, with a little more speed and turnaround than you might expect. Uh, I think you can look at some of the things that some of the justices said about executive power and immigration when Texas versus the United States is being argued. And they seem to suggest they're coming at it from a different place now with the new president in power. And I think you've even seen some academics uh, having to rush to, to revise some of their previous claims about the presidency and immigration law when the immigration law is in the hands of the wrong president, in their view. Uh, I, mean, I think on the travel ban itself, uh, there's a lot of sort of technical doctrinal parsing of Kleindienst versus Mandel, and does facially legitimate and bona fide mean two things or one thing, about which I still have not figured out my own view. Uh, the thing I do think the most strongly is that the court shouldn't and won't at any point say something like, you know, uh, Donald Trump does not exercise the normal powers of the President of the United States because he's not a normal president, even though I think that's a thing a lot of people think and maybe some of the justices think. But I think that, that shouldn't be a part of the, the consideration. And I, I don't think they'll explicitly say that, even if some of them think it. Uh, and I do think it, I mean, it, the court seems to, on, they seem to be more cohesive on when they're <clears throat> looking at separation of powers issues. Um, they don't seem to break down quite as much in terms of party lines, it would seem. I, but but the adding the immigration component to it, I think, right. changes, you know, I think if we're looking, it changes the component here. Uh, and I, I would have said that more before Zivotofsky a couple of years ago, where there was more of an ideological split in recognizing uh, the president's, president's foreign affairs power over Israel and Jerusalem than I might have expected. And, and sometimes I fear we do get that. Rick, you're just dying to weigh in, aren't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the only thing I would say that you know, kind of reflects the comments that Paul made is that, uh, generally speaking, of course, you know, courts have been fairly deferential to executive claims of national security. They become less deferential in general in the more modern period. And I think that when courts have reasons to be concerned about whether national security justifications are being invoked sort of pretextually or without a lot of credibility, uh, they're going to be more aggressive. But how do they actually assess that? I think they're very reluctant to make substantive judgments because they don't feel they have access to the relevant information. But they do, I think, again, maybe sub rosa, uh, pay attention to the processes through which these decisions were reached. And the more credible the process appears to be, the more comfortable they're they are in deferring. And as Paul said, uh, the less the process looks like a process that engaged a genuine deliberation about national security among the people in the institutions of government who have that expertise, I, I think it, the more likely they are to express a little bit more skepticism. Well, the fact that this is the third iteration, that makes, a big that difference. makes a big difference. Yeah, I think so. And it's changed shape in various ways, um, but Charles? I'll leave it there. Well, I, I um, have a question to, to Paul, really. <clears throat> How would the concept of honor in the judicial office shed light on this case? Because it seems to me, if, uh, you know, one could give an account of the office of the judge to be, uh, to, to, um, be restrained uh, to uh, abide by stare decisis. I mean, one could give a very traditional account of what the, his role in the rule of law is. And one could give a very different account of the honorable thing to do is to help the suffering potential Muslim immigrants uh, to do justice in the case before you, regardless of precedent or even law. And, it, and the definition of what is honorable depends in really on which constitution you're looking up to. So I guess I'd say um, I don't, I, there are some, an increasing number of people writing uh, lovely work on odes and um, kind of character-based views of the constitution and constitutional interpretation. Some of it, I think, 
derives too detailed a set of conclusions uh, from what's available. Um, I think an, uh, kind of a virtue or aritaic uh, approach to judging here wouldn't issue in some specific um, set of instructions, uh, but you would have to look at the terms of the I think the judicial office, the specific language of the judicial oath, in my sense is, um, um, yes, I, I don't think I'm going to try to answer the question kind of which constitution a judge who takes seriously, um, dutifully, the oath and tries to understand it as best as he or she can is going to feel compelled to, um, to arrive at uh, or to, to interpret. Um, I think there is room for the kind of honorable judge. There's a necessity for the honorable judge to understand there to be at least some limits on that office, certainly. So for instance, this is a terrible policy. I empathize with the clear victims here. That's not enough. That's not kind of judicial duty. Mark? So I was going to say I have nothing interesting to say in my capacity as a lawyer about the uh, case. I mean, uh, but then some of the comments uh, lead me to refer to my, you know, my guide in this sort of thing, which is not going to be very helpful to people, but uh, which is uh, Carl Llewellyn, who talked about in response to uh, Charles's observation or question. Uh, judges who reach, who, who provide wisdom in result that makes sense for all of us, which is a very nice combination of the uh, you know, case-specific and rule-oriented uh, uh, formulation. And Llewellyn uh, talked of, my students love this, uh, talked of uh, uh, the, uh, the law of singing reason. So when you read the opinion, the heavenly choir descends, and you know, and there's something to that. Um, it, it captures something about uh, how how judges uh, properly exercise the power conferred on them by their office, uh, and it also captures something about the importance of rhetoric and how rhetoric actually um, effective rhetoric. Uh, uh, has to address the audience as it is. And so things that would have been effective 30 years ago might not be effective now, and so on. Um, it's that way of thinking about the problem that I w would want to commend. But it doesn't tell me, in my capacity as a lawyer, what the right result in the case uh, is. Well, not what, I guess, in terms of, well, we're going to turn it over to the audience to ask questions, but if uh, the last time I was here we predicted on the Obamacare case what was going to happen, and <laughs> I was wrong. I didn't anticipate the Chief Justice, so uh, the, uh, then they still asked me back. So <laughs> is, it, is, the, is, the, is the government going to win or lose? Rick? And uh, I, think the, I think the government's going to win. The government's going to win? I think. What the numbers? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, it was a way I was wondering. I, yeah. I think they're going to uphold the executive order. Yes. And what will it be? Will it be nine zip or what will the numbers be? <laughs> um, I don't know if I want to go to the next level of you hazard prediction. Who. So. Okay. Uh, the government will mostly win seven two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't do this sort of thing. <laughs> and you don't either? I'll refrain from particular. Can I, I invoke the Yogi Bear line, be, though? I think it's going to be 6 3. To uphold it. Yes. I remember that great line right, of Yogi so Bear? Questions the trouble from the about audience. Predictions? Is there about the future? <laughs> but I think that, but the, you know, just like with um, on Obamacare when we bet on it, and people have life goes on, so life will go on. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, this was a terrific panel. Um, I'm Elon Werman. I'm a non-resident fellow here at the Stanford uh, Constitutional Law Center and about to start teaching at ASU. Uh, my question is about your paper, Rick, and I'll preface it with the observation that I am a former student of Wills, of Charles, and of 
Michaels, and so if my question so you're is hopeless. totally <laughs> off base, you know whom to blame. Uh, so I wanted to actually push back a little bit about the descriptive claim in your paper, in particularly in times of divided government, because if I've understood the paper correctly, and I think it's still, my understanding is right after hearing your remarks, it's only in times of divided government when checks and balances are really going to be working in any sort of capacity, and they're actually going to be working on steroids. But it seems to me that this claim has it exactly back. Uh, to, and, and I may be wrong, and that's why I'm posing the question, uh, but due to other institutional and doctrinal changes, uh, especially since the 1980s but from before, when we exist in, a, in periods of divided government now, we'll see something else. We'll see a dramatic increase in executive unilateralism, which by definition, I think, undermines the separation of powers. In other words, the president will, by pen and phone, not just execute the law, but make policy as well as execute the law. Now Congress, this divided by hypothesis, this Congress of a different party will, can enact a bill as the Congress under the Obama administration routinely tried to do and the president will veto it and it takes a mere one third of a single house of the United States Congress to uphold uh, the president's veto and the president's unilateral action. So I, I think we saw this in uh, the o Obama years and I think we will see it after 2018, if the Democrats take the House. So, th so this is my intuition that actually the separation of powers breaks down in times of, uh, uh, of divided government today because we'll see an increase in unilateralism. So my question is, is that intuition wrong uh, for obvious reasons that I'm, that I'm missing and have you seen sort of data on this? That's my first question. And if it's not wrong or if there's something to it, aren't there obvious doctrinal, uh, constitutional doctrines where we actually could be looking to to resolve this problem, namely the reinvigorating the non-delegation doctrine or abolishing the Chevron doctrine or, or, or things of that sort, which actually would force uh, the reining in of executive unilateralism. So I'm not sure where you think that differs from what I'm trying to communicate. So let me sort of explain what I think I'm saying. Um, so in divided government, the system actually in both forms of government uh, but in divided government, the system is not going to function as originally envisioned. With hyperpolarized political parties, you're going to get exactly what you describe and what we all know, uh, which is uh, the difficulty of, of working through the normal political process. And that will have all sorts of distorting effects on other parts of the system. So it will mean that because presidents have demands for action, someone has to take responsibility for various sorts of issues, elections are at stake, um, inevitably, yes, you'll get an expansion of unilateral executive power. Um, you'll also get uh, court decisions in the statutory area that are, are stickier. It will be far more difficult for Congress to respond if it, if the court got it wrong by some measure, let's say by what the original legislature intended or what the text fairly read commands, um, courts will certainly have more space within which they have freedom of action under divided government. Um, neither of those manifestations of the way the system functions under divided government are consistent with at least the way I understand the separation of powers premises and original kind of aspirations and vision. Uh, so um, I think these are distortions uh, that are, yes, inevitable when the normal political process set up by the Constitution breaks down because it can't handle, wasn't designed for the kind of hyperpolarized political parties that we have. And you combine this with the filibuster rule, which of course is a, a legislative internal rule, not something that's emerged other than by, by dint of the Senate's own prerogatives. Um, and it only accentuates the difficulty of making a divided government system function through the normal legislative process. It breaks down, as you say. So I had a question about um, if the uh, court wanted to get into the Establishment Clause arguments in the travel ban and whether the court should be constrained to only look at the four corners of the executive order or whether things like Trump tweets or Trump speeches should also be considered by the court. Uh, 
I don't, what's the formalist view on that, Will? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the, doctrin- the formalist doctrinal answer, I think, turns on this, on this parsing of the court's current rule of non-reviewability in immigration law and whether the requirement that it be facially legitimate and bona fide is facially, that's one thing, uh, or whether that's two things. So you can look on its face and then also behind it to see if it's bona fide, which has been the view of the lower courts that have really against the administration. Uh, I think that latter view doesn't uh, make sense of the cases as they've been decided. Uh, and nobody has argued that the whole doctrine of non-reviewability is uh, you know, wrong on originalist grounds that should be gotten rid of. So I, I think that the current law pushes against reviewing that kind of the, the tweets. Uh, and I'd actually be surprised if the court made any reference to them in its opinion. But I'm often surprised. <laughs> Am I on? I think so. So it's Madison time again, guys. <laughs> and, but there's it's like having time. him here, Jack. In fact, you're almost as old as he would be. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Uh, so I, I want to press you on the idea of the, the place that separation of powers has in the, in the Madisonian Constitution, which is something I've written about in different places. Because I, I think it's easy to distort and exaggerate how important a role that concept actually played in Madison's thinking. So to take a kind of formalist slash, a strong formalist slash originalist view on this strikes me as being a very problematic proposition. So there are two or three points to be made here. The first one comes, you guys, I think, will all know the text. Uh, put ambition must be made a counteract ambition aside for one second. Madison's most telling statement about separation of powers comes, Will, as you know, from Federal 37, very good, where he says, experience has instructed us that no skill in the science of government has yet been able to discriminate and define with sufficient certainty its three great provinces, the legislative, executive, judiciary, or even the privileges and powers of the different legislative branches. Questions daily occur in the course of practice which prove the obscurity which reigns in these subjects and which puzzle the greatest adepts in political science. Then you turn to Federalist 51, which is the classic statement. And it's true, it has, it, it, there are a few great sentences there. Ambition must be made a counter ambition. The interest of the man, you know, uh, must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. Okay, that's great stuff. <laughs> Charlie and I have gone a long way um, in respect to that text. But then the striking thing about it is Madison has almost nothing to say substantively about the separation of powers. The one point he addresses in, in, the, in the balance of the essay, remember the two prior essays were about Jefferson's idea, which is not separation of powers, but resort to the people. All Madison says is, look, there, you know, he, he focuses on the Senate. The reason he focuses on the Senate is because in a classic Montesquieuian sense, the dominant issue in 87 88 was, is the Senate the one institution that, that's going to impose the greatest damage on a Montesquieuian notion? Why? Because it has a legislative, executive, and through impeachments, judicial power. Beyond that, Mazin says almost nothing about it. And then, if you carry the story forward as a starting point, and this is why I think my position is probably closest to Marx, um, then it says what happens, you know, Mazin originally thinks, well, the greatest danger of separation is going to come from whichever branch of the people is most, whichever branch of government is most directly re- representative of the people, they will be the lower house of the assembly, being the house of representatives. That proposition works, you know, for Washington's first term. It's great on the bank issue because that's a you know, that all pivots on necessary and proper. When you get to Washington's second term and everything turns to the presidency, Madison at that point is preoccupied with how do you check presidential power. The presidency, much to his surprise, because he had a very under-informed conception of presidential power, unlike Hamilton. Uh, so at that point, Madison has to react. Uh, and I think the way he reacts, though, illustrates the underlying proposition in, in Federal 37. This is a very hazy area. You can start with certain core definitions of a fairly general nature about, you know, enacting, executing, and adjudicating laws. But when you get down to the brass tacks of actually running a government, uh, and think about the, came, the claims and counterclaims that different branches are going to make, it's, you know, it's a very tricky situation. And so this whole idea... So do you think he's wrong, or do you have a question? Yeah, no, no, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, question observation. I mean, you know, the, ba- you know, the basic observation is um, you cannot place that great interpretive weight on Madison's thinking is I think Rick's starting position would start to do, and I think probably Will's position would do. 
And then, once you get into the, you know, the actual facts and cases, it's the dynamics of the issues, the dynamics of the situation, and it's the politics which spins around them, which actually determines how this issue plays out. Well, I know we're, I think, pretty much at time, right? Um, unless you want to have, is there a short defense? There's a 65-page defense, but I'll deliver it later. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank my panel. Um, I. They were a pleasure to work with, and I want to thank all of you for interfacing with us. And